Welcome to the latest, second to last, in a series of lectures in the College Lecture Series. I'm John Murphy. I'm the Dean of the College of Architecture. It's my job to simply welcome you and thank you for coming this evening. This is our first construction panel discussion we've had in the series, and somebody was asking me when we started this five years ago. So this has been a long time in coming to get the construction folks on stage and hear some things that they have to say. So at this time, I'll let the chair, Yomas Karasulu, you know him as Dr. K, introduce the panel and tell you something about the companies that are represented. Thank you. Um, let, let, me, let me start with this. Um, uh, first of all, let, let me thank the um, lecture committee that put this uh, effort together this year. Uh, Mr. Ian came from Department of uh, Architecture and Dr. Swat Gunhan uh, from Department of Construction Science. Um, this is exciting. Uh, we're going to talk about construction, so I'm happy. Um, let, let me tell you why we're doing this with this particular title. Um, we are a great industry. We have a unique way of doing things. Um, we take risks to complete projects. Um, and we have a unique culture. Uh, we do things a little different. A firm handshake still means something in our industry. Our word carries a weight. We got one bad habit. We are too humble to talk about it. Um, there's a reason for that. Uh, we are competitive. So when a construction company figures out an effective way of doing things, that's competitive advantage. We don't want to talk about it. Uh, when things are a little different than the plan, it's usually bad. We don't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, so in other words, the tradition of recording construction history does not exist. Um, the only way to record this is to actually ask the people who's done it. Uh, and that's our plan for tonight. Let me see. Um, we have five distinguished guests. I don't think they need any introduction uh, in Texas or San Antonio. Um, they are actually founding members of our Industry Advisory Council. Uh, so I'm going to read this one because I wrote this one. It took a little while. Um, well, number one, they were here before the construction program was here. Um, this is the reason we actually have a construction program. They were here when we started offering construction classes. They were here when our students needed internship. They were here when our students needed scholarships. And then they were here when our students needed internships and jobs. And they're still here. So let, let me first say the, the founding members of our advisory council is two associations, AGC San Antonio chapter, ABC South Texas chapter, and we have George General Contractors, Bartlett Cox General Contractors, Galaxy Builders, uh, Goodo Brothers Construction, Leonard Contracting, Merrick Brother Systems, and Spoglass. Okay, I got very short introduction for you because we want you to talk about it. Um, so let me read this. And this is from the internet, so I'm sure there's a mistake. Um, George General Contractors, founded in 1967, uh, a commercial general contractor headquartered in San Antonio. Um, George serves his clients through Texas in civic healthcare, educational hospitality, and retail projects. And joining us in the panel today is Mr. Gary Joris, President and CEO of uh, George General Contractors. Joris is a founding member of UTSA Council. And Mr. Joris actually is the founding chair and immediate past president. So thanks for coming. You're welcome. Um, then we have Bartlett Cox General Contractors, founded in 1959, uh, a commercial general contractor headquartered in San Antonio. Um, Services clients through Texas in corporate, government, healthcare, and education projects. Uh, joining us in the panel today is Mr. Harry Mueller, president of Bartlett Cox General Contractors. Bartlett Cox is a founding member of our council, and Mr. Mueller is our current president. Then we have Alpha Building Corporation, founded in 1969. Alpha Building Corporation provides a broad area of construction services for facilities in the military, higher education, healthcare, and private markets. Headquartered in San Antonio. Uh, let's see, joining us today is Ms. Kathy Acock, president of Alpha Building Corporation. Uh, Alpha Building Corporation, again, is a founding member, and Ms. Acock is actually our vice president. Um, then we have Guido Brothers Construction, founded in 1927. I know I don't look that old. <laughs> <laughs> um, is a commercial general contractor, headquartered in San Antonio again. Um, they serve their clients in San Antonio and throughout Texas in government, uh, governmental institutional healthcare and education projects. Uh, joining us today is Mr. Tom Guido, uh, president of Guido Construction. 
founding member of UTSA Advisory Council and a member of Executive Committee. And we got Galaxy Builders, uh, founded in 1991, uh, commercial general contractor headquartered in San Antonio. Uh, let's see, uh, serving clients in San Antonio throughout Texas in multifamily, institutional, and commercial projects. Joining us is Mr. Ern Verma, chairman of Galaxy Builders. Uh, Galaxy also is a founding member, and Mr. Verma is an executive committee member of the council. So please uh, join me in welcoming our guest. My, my job is done. This is on you. Now. Um, first question, and, and this is kind of a, a, a mix. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about your personal background and your company background. Uh, I tried to give a little introduction, but I'm sure it is not enough. So, would you like to start? I get to be the lucky first one. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everybody for coming here this evening. Uh, my name is Gary Joris. Um, as um, was mentioned, uh, our company started in 1967. My dad started the business. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1973, and I guess I was fortunate that I figured out uh, early on that I was going to go into the construction uh, industry. I worked uh, summers in high school and summers in college doing construction. Um, I took uh, uh, shop classes all through school and uh, actually worked half a day my senior year in a, in a vocational industrial clubs of America. So uh, it's kind of been in my blood all my life. Uh, my uh, uh, granddad on my mom's side was in the construction business. He was in the lath and plaster business, uh, Ollie Tope lath and plaster. So uh, it's something that I've done ever since uh, I can remember. Um, I got uh, out of college in 78 uh, and went to work for the company and, you know, worked from the ground uh, up. I uh, started as a project manager at that time. Uh, during all the summers I'd worked, I'd worked in the fields. So it was working on forums and, and digging ditches, whatever it takes, uh, the kind of stuff you work real hard to get out of uh, by going to college. Uh, but I, you know, I, can't, I did you know, everything from estimating, project management, uh, to work our way up to, uh, through, um, you know, to the, to the point in time where my dad uh, retired about uh, 15 years ago, and uh, uh, from then that, you know, we've, we've continued to, to grow. My uh, dad, uh, lost my dad about nine years ago to Alzheimer's, but uh, so if I forget something during this presentation, that's probably uh, part, of the, part of the family, <laughs> right? Um, but no, it's been, it's been an exciting business. It's, uh, this is a fun and, and challenging and rewarding business. And uh, so it's, it's uh, that's about it for me, I guess. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Harry Miller. I'm with Bartlett Cock General Contractors. Just a little bit about, uh, more about the company background. As you know, as mentioned, we start, or I, I didn't start the company. Our founder, Bartlett Cock Jr., uh, founded the company in 1959. He was actually the, the son of a pretty reputable architect uh, here in San Antonio. Uh, Bart decided he did not want to go the architecture route, so he went to construction route and founded the company and, uh, and worked through the company until about 1989 uh, when he de determined that none of his children were going to enter the construction business. He decided to sell the company to the employees, and now today we're 75 employee, owned, 75 employee owners of the company. Uh, the company does primarily uh, what we like to say are projects of a higher purpose, educational, uh, K through 12, higher education, medical projects, a lot of re religious facilities, uh, and, and other miscellaneous projects. I personally started with the company in 1985. Prior to that, uh, I was a terrible, terrible student growing up and got, barely made it out of high school and, and quite honestly never even thought twice about what I wanted to do uh, when I got out of high school. I, I wanted to go to work in construction. And my mom said, no, you're, you're going to go to college. And so that worked for about six months when she found out I was uh, 
sleeping in my truck during class down at SAC, she said, okay, go to work. And uh, <laughs> that's what I did. I did actually take two years and go up to Waco at a, a little school up there called Texas State Technical Institute at the time and, and ha had a construction program there and got an associate's degree. But I learned what I know in construction about working on projects and uh, fortunately I had the opportunity, although my dad was not in construction, he, he, he was in the brewing business, but uh, and I should have followed him, dang it. It would have been a lot more fun. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he had a lot of friends that were in construction business. And I, I literally started, uh, when you say from the ground up, I mean, I started uh, six foot in the ground digging ditches, uh, installing utilities, underground utilities for a local plumbing and utility company. And then worked other summers for various general contractors and then uh, finally took full-time position with, with Bart Lecoq in 1985 and, and have worked in every, just about every capacity you can imagine in a construction business with the exception of accounting and marketing, uh, although I do quite a bit of that in my position today. But, uh, but starting in, as a, in the field as a layout engineer and then a project engineer and a project manager and, you know, up, up through the chain. and uh, so. Uh, and I know Gary uh, has a lot of similarities, and, and many of us do, uh, growing up and spending that much time in one company. You know, you get to a lot, a lot of people, you know, you've been around a long time and longevity. You, you can relate to the workers that work for you because you've been in their shoes. And I think there's a lot of strength in that uh, when you get to uh, the management side of a construction operation. Hi, I'm Kathleen Acock, and um you know, just in the last, since I've been with the industry council and I've had the opportunity to work with these gentlemen, I realize that for as far apart as we think our experiences are, they really are very common. Um, I thought, I, I, I have always thought, well, you know, I'm one of the few that came out of a family business. And no, my, my history just tracks Gary's almost ex exactly, except I didn't have to dig ditches to get my job. Uh, and, and certainly Tom Guido over here, the family is well renowned here in uh, San Antonio. Uh, my background was that my parents founded the firm in 69 and it was uh, mother did the accounting and my dad did the project management and the estimating. In about 77, uh, I came into the firm and my dad provided me um, uh, a really uh, fast pace, highly Im important and technical job of typing purchase orders. Um, and since I did that so well, I was allowed to graduate into doing some minor buying and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, the company grew and, and I grew and got a little smarter, slowly but surely. And it's at some point in time in Houston, I was uh, project managing a library and a fire station and uh, other assorted uh, facilities and buildings and also participated in the marketing process for the company and learned a little bit there. But I'll tell you where I, I really finally learned and saw this whole thing as, as one piece that needs to be moving forward is uh, both my parents died, uh, 86 and then in 93, and I kind of looked around and I didn't have brothers or sisters stepping up to the plate, so it was sort of tag your it. Um, and I had the opportunity, I could have done two things at the time. I could have sold the company uh, or just dug in and stayed and tried to make something of it. And when I looked at the first option, I discovered very quickly there's not a big market for small construction companies because there's not a lot of trouble getting into this industry. So it looked like the latter was my only option, but I was fortunate that the employees, the surety, and the bank stayed with me. <coughs> and so we've continued until today. Um, we're getting ready to go to the third generation, and I cannot be more proud uh, of that. Uh, and I understand y'all probably will be too quickly, um, but. That, that is something that doesn't happen very often, and I uh, attribute it to uh, the fact that we've been able to keep our people and we've been able to work in a good environment here in San Antonio. And so I certainly commend uh, to you the, to seek jobs with contractors here locally because uh, this city and this, this uh, industry have a lot to offer. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Tom Guido. I'm with Guido Brothers Construction Company. Uh, I, the, I, my, I will start out by the cl disclaimer that we're a woman-owned business. Guido Brothers yes. Construction Company. Anyway, uh, my wife, uh, Marianne, is the CEO of our company, and uh, it's, um, I, I have to say it's not gotten us one job, but it's, it's, it, it's fantastic the way that she really runs and manages the company. My principal responsibility is in estimating, uh, as it has been since almost when I started working uh, after I graduated from college. My, my personal background, uh, you know, to answer the question, how did you get in the construction industry, uh, I would say I was born into it, I was summered into it, and I've always loved it. It, uh, it is uh, one of the most rewarding things that can be done because um, you know, I go by and find buildings with our name on it for buildings that my grandfather built. I I'm actually the third generation. Uh, my, my sons are the fourth generation and my daughter that works in our company. Um, a little bit about Guido Brothers Construction Company, though. We were founded uh, by my grandfather. The first building that I know of that we built was the Italian church downtown. And uh, my grandfather was in partnership with uh, Falbo and uh, he decided to start his own company. And uh, oddly enough, it's, it was my, my grandfather and his uh, brother, Frank Guido, and then uh, it was my dad, Cosmo, and his brother, Louis Guido Jr. And then uh, <coughs> it was my brother, Brazes, and myself, and then we bought my brother out about seven years ago, six years ago, and um, we're, uh, you know, we've actually gone through a little growth f uh, period here the last five or six years, which is, pretty exciting for, for us and for the city. Um, when we started out, we were building homes and, and we did a lot of school work for the SAISD in the 50s and 60s. Uh, we were very instrumental in the building of Hemisphere 68, um, which we survived, luckily. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I came into the business, we, we started what I, I think we started doing what I call public-private projects at the time. They were really private uh, uh, churches, um, museums, uh, things that were privately developed, but really the public was in them all the time. Um, one of the real specialties that my grandfather did, uh, we have some 70-ton jacks in our warehouse where, where he jacked up the Quarrel County Courthouse in the mid-30s uh, working with uh, Willard Simpson, some of the old names of uh, structural firms that really don't even exist anymore. At any rate, um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the industry that we are in, the only way that we, all of us, can exist are because of people like you all. Um, we have, uh, have some amazing people working for us that do totally um, mind-blowing things. Uh, the, the people that work in this industry, I found through my associations throughout the country, are hardworking, sincere, dedicated, honest, and you know, I, I, I just want to plug my dad and my grandfather because the one thing that they taught me that was the most important thing was integrity. And if you don't have integrity, get out of the business because that's what you need to exist. So uh, I welcome the opportunity. I'm very honored to be included and in. turn it over to Aaron. Thanks, Tom. Um, I want to thank uh, UTSA School of Architecture for arranging this and also want to thank them for listening to our concerns over the last few years about requiring local talent to come in our firms and homegrown talent. And that's how this construction management program has started. So we want to thank the faculty, UTSA, for that. Uh, about my, my personal uh, background, you can probably tell from my accent that I was not born here, and I was not raised here. I I'm, I'm come from India. I came to US uh, 45 years ago. Uh, I had done my degree in civil engineering, then I have when I came here, I was already working in construction business since 1963. 
After that, I became a, uh, an estimator for a large uh, real estate development company and uh, became chief estimator. That's how I broke into the industry here and learned uh, the ways of construction me means and methods, which were a little different, but uh, I was able to adapt to them very quickly. And at that time, I went to school while I was working. I did my master's in civil engineering from Cooper Union School of Engineering in New York, if anybody who's in, from Northeast will remember, know that school. And uh, we, my wife and I, we came here in 1977 to San Antonio, so we have been here 37 years now. And I went to work with a local developer who is an extremely successful real estate developer, uh, Walter Embry. And I became the president of Embry Construction within one year. And I ran that company for 14 years. We were mostly doing multifamily projects, multifamily housing projects, and built projects in nine different states. So I was traveling all the time, looking for always good talent to come to, to work for us. Company became very successful. Then came 1989, 1990 when you guys probably were not, some of you were not born then I guess. There was a savings and loan crisis in the state of Texas, which really, really hurt our business badly. So we went back to being very small retrenched, uh, had to let a lot of people go, which was the most difficult experience I had to go through. And then well, there was no construction work left. And so uh, Walter was suggesting to me that I should do property management, which I had no interest in, because I always wanted to go build things. So I had to think hard. Uh, so at the age of 50, I started this company, Galaxy Builders, with nothing. We were at least an office, so one's conference room, and that's where I was, and I had one, one guy I hired, and you just worked, and 18, 20 hours a day, bed jobs, bed jobs, and then my, my first uh, reckoning that I could not get bond, and I would talk to our surety companies that I have done, millions of dollars worth of work. I've already built 25,000 apartments all over the country, and I cannot get a bond. He said, well, that was on somebody else's account. You have to start over. So finally, I got a bond for $100,000. That was the first job we got here in San Antonio. Over the next five years or six years, now our bonding capacity grew to $120 million. And that all was possible because of a lot of dedicated employees we have, a lot of great clients we have, and the association that we belong to in our industry where these wonderful people who belong to, and they're always helping each other. And um, so that's where our success came from. Uh, 2009 was our best year. After that, we, we all went through this recession, and that did take a toll on us, obviously. We had to cut back our staffing by one-third. We are now coming out of it now, and it has is, it is taken its toll. Uh, but our foundation is very strong, and uh, our company is uh, strong, our financials are very strong, and it all comes from hands-on hands -on work and oversight and not uh, delegating to the point where you, you don't know where, where your house is standing or burning. So that is our background. I Basically, I'm semi-retired now. I've got uh, two sons who are in the business. One is running our construction company, and we have already started a, uh, a development company. He's running the development company where we develop our own projects. Uh, right now, he happens to be, our older son happens to be our biggest client for, for a contracting company. 
so that's, that's what we are currently doing. Uh, as long as I'm physically fit, I'll continue to, to work, not as, as hard as I used to, but this, this, this business is so intoxicating that you cannot just sit at home and just watch. <laughs> it is incredibly, you're passionate about this business. That's how I am. And that is, that is our story so far. Um, the, the next one is a fun one. I'm, I'm actually curious about this one. Um, your most memorable project. You want to start the other end this way? Or you want to go, go, ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Well, you know, we, I have been and our company have been involved with a lot of projects. I don't know that I can say that there was the most memorable. Uh, I guess the one that made the most money last year might be this year. This year's most memorable. <laughs> um, you know, I'd have to say we have some very exciting accounts, some people that we do a lot of repeat work with. Um, uh, we have a long-term relationship with uh, Baptist Hospital. We just finished putting a six-story addition on top of a, another six-story building at, at Northeast Baptist, which was certainly had its challenges and was uh, different than most projects. Um, we've got a long-term relationship with HEB and they are constantly uh, working with us to fine tune and hone and shorten schedules. Uh, so if any of you have seen HEBs being built, it's amazing how shorter time schedules they can throw the stores up in five months, six months, it's, uh, and they keep adding more and more. Um, Right now, you know, we're working on the uh, Alamo Stadium right now on, on the, the 281, which is a very exciting project, uh, the old historical uh, Alamo Stadium, football stadium, and uh, we're about 75 or 80 percent complete with that project. That's been, been a fun project. We've got a $40 million project out at UTSA on the north side that's been a fun project. It's going to be a, a beautiful project when it's, fin when it's finished. Uh, it'll be a memorable one if it's profitable, but um, you know there's a lot of lot of lot of exciting projects. They're all they're all fun. They all have challenges. Um, I guess the the best uh, most memorable ones are the ones that end up with a with a good client at the end of the job and uh, good relationships and working through those are the sometimes the biggest biggest challenge to the job because all jobs have challenges and it's just working through those as a team and. Uh, trying to keep everybody happy in the process. I, I would tell you a story about a, a, a project that if Bartlett was here, he would probably mention to you. And I wasn't around when this happened, but it, it's, a, it's a pretty funny story. And it's memorable. I wouldn't say it was profitable. I don't think it put our company on the map because it was very few people knew it happened. But uh, I think this happened around in, in the mid-'70s, uh, Bartlett got a call from a friend of his who, who ran a funeral home. And uh, the funeral home had a special request. A, a lady had passed away, a fairly wealthy, uh, I don't know about being well known, but a wealthy, eccentric lady here in San Antonio. And one of her dying wishes, and I assume this was spelled out in her will, was to be buried in her, I don't know if it was a Maserati, uh, what is that car you drive, Gary? Ferrari. Ferrari. <laughs> it might have been a Ferrari. <laughs> I'd drive a pickup. Uh, but she, her wish was to be buried in a Ferrari in her nightgown. And so uh, Bartlett said, well, we don't know how to do that. And he said, well, you don't need to do anything except build us a big concrete box. We'll take it from there. So to this day, Bartlett has never... He tells that story, but he's never told us who she was or where she's buried. But, so somewhere in San Antonio, there's a, a rich old lady buried in a Maserati or a Ferrari in her nightgown. Uh, no, but seriously, uh, some of the projects that I think would be most memorable. <laughs> Did you know about that, Tommy? Uh, I remember when it happened, but I, yeah. I can't remember the lady's yeah. name. No, I, I've seen the grave site. It's true. Is, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's one of the old cemeteries. But some of the more memorable projects, I think, that... Uh, Memorable to me is a project that helps put your company on the map or, uh, and helps, re, uh, as Gary's talked about, establish clients, long-lasting clients, and, and, and projects that you can drive by. And quite honestly, one of the reasons I got in this business and got in the construction business is because there was a lot of gratification to be able to drive by 
a building that you had a hand in, in a building and it's going to be there for 50 or 75 or 100 years and you can talk to your children or grandchildren about it and, your, and whoever else wants to listen. <laughs> Uh, but two of the, I would say two projects. One is completed and one is under construction. Uh, but one is the Children's Cancer, Cancer uh, Research Center at the University of, Tel uh, or University of Texas Health Science Center, uh, at the medical center. Uh, this is a project that was completed uh, probably in about 1992, 93. But the, but the research that's going on in those facilities is phenomenal. And the, the impact that we, we, we hope that it's had and then we hope miracles happen in the future uh, with, with finding cures for cancer, particularly in children, is, is of high importance to us. Uh, another project that is, uh, is top on our list right now <laughs> is not far from here over at uh, the old Santa Rosa Hospital. And I don't know how many of you guys probably were around back in the day, but if you were born in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, you were born at the Nix Hospital or the Santa Rosa Hospital. Mm -hmm. I was born at the Nix Hospital. But uh, so the Santa Rosa Hospital has been around forever, uh, but the current transformation into a children's hospital uh, in, in, in that facility is another project that's near and dear to our heart. We're really just kind of on the front end of that project, but uh, it'll go on another two years. But uh, to, to look at the vision, I don't know how many of you have heard or seen some of the marketing material that, that Children's Hospital San Antonio has been putting out and talking about. But, to listen to their mission is pretty pretty special to us. So I think those are two very memorable projects for us. Well, I'm going to be a little bit of a change of pace because uh, we don't we don't do projects that large typically. Uh, we do delivery order construction, and so what I look back on is more like a, a a book of work where that book tells the story of a particular client. For example, we've been with UTSA as their delivery order contractor for about 10 years now, and we've enjoyed 20 years at Texas A&M University. And so each project that we complete is one more that people really enjoy because it happens quickly, they move in quickly, uh, and it gets put to its intended use quickly. Um, some of you may recognize some of these projects we've done here at UTSA, but for example, uh, the food courts at JPL and UC, both of those. We've put in Starbucks, we've done Subways, we've done Chick-fil-A's, and we find that with the food courts, people are lined up before we're finished <laughs> cleaning the food court. Uh, we've done, we did the extension to Bar Shop Road, we did the Chaparral Village swimming pool, uh, we did the sport court that's down here at, uh, isn't it at Monterey, right. at the Monterey building? Um, and <laughs> speaking of the Monterey building, we've worked in every single floor of the Monterey building, including uh, Dr. Harriet Romo's uh, Capri offices on the third floor. third floor. And then we got the project to renovate the fourth floor for the new construction science and management department. So. You, you kind of get the sense or the flavor of what we do. And as far as we're concerned here at Alpha, we, do, we don't do the great big projects. We do the smaller projects. They move quickly. People get them uh, into service quickly. And like Harry, we kind of look at our work as if uh, we are creating environments where great things can happen. So whether it's higher ed or K through 12 or the military, um, we have kind of created a book of work and long-term clients that have uh, sustained us and rewarded us for our efforts. I didn't think this was a very fair question to be able to pick one either. Um, <laughs> actually, one of the, uh, uh, the, the projects that I want to talk about, uh, we have had the wonderful opportunity and challenging opportunity at the same time to work for some really world-class architects that have worked in San Antonio, uh, like uh, the Cambridge Seven uh, out of uh, Boston or Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Emilio Ambas out of New York City, and uh, we worked for Charles Moore. You know, one of the 
one of the, uh, it scares me a little bit, and I, I really would like to ask everybody here if they have the same thing, but it kind of scares me because two of the buildings that I've built have actually been torn down in my lifetime. <laughs> and it's kind of scary the first time it happened. Uh, it's, it has nothing to do with the quality of the construction or anything. It was the, the use of the building by whoever had it built changed, and so they tore them down. So anyway, um, the, the most, I think, um, you know, we've, we've worked for uh, the Sisters of Charity of Incarnate Word, SeaWorld, uh, the Witty Museum. Um, one of the, we, in, in our earlier lifetime, uh, we, we, we did uh, Kit Goldsberry's house, which was a fabulous project. It took way too long and cost way too much money, but, but the, the, uh, my project manager on the job said, uh, you know, I think there's some churches in Mexico that don't have any doors on them anymore because of all the reused doors we put in the project. But anyway, um, the Botanical Garden, uh, Emilio Ambas built, and uh, I'll never forget the story that you walked in behind this wall and there was a courtyard, and the courtyard was open, open air, and it was going to have a sculpture of a tree to represent that you were coming into a place where nature was, but they didn't have the money so they just put a real tree in there, but it was supposed to be a sculpture of a tree. And uh, when we did the project, um, there's some really spectacular concrete on that job. And when we went to put in the swimming pool, they, uh, he said, I want the, the, the beginning plasterers to do it because I want it to look like it's a natural uh, pond and not a man-made pond. Uh, but the, the, the most important one that I, that I learned uh, what I wanted to do uh, in the business was from the Cambridge Seven, and it was at the San Antonio Museum of Art. And I can remember the bid to this day because it was three million nine hundred and ninety-nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine dollars, and that was in 1979, I think, or so. But the reason that job was so memorable because the first day of the first project meeting. The architect said, Tommy, get all your subcontractors in the room. Uh, we're going to have uh, a pre-construction conference, which wasn't out of the ordinary. But we had it down at the museum underneath where the auditorium is, and it was musty, and we had to bring in lights. And he starts off, and, and, and I learned, he said, whenever you say, normally, this is what I do, I'm going to stop you in your tracks and tell you, I don't care what you normally do. You're going to do what's on these plans and in these specs. And, you know, if you've never done it before, you're going to figure out how to do it because every time, you know, and so uh, some of the really uh, interesting things about that job, there is a piece of glass on the elevator, if, if you've ever been there, that's, that's gigantic. I don't know if it's 20 by 20 or gi really big piece of one inch thick uh, tempered glass. And the subcontractor came to me, you know, six months into the job and said, you know, we can't, we cannot find this glass. It's not made anywhere in the world. And I called the architect up and he got his people to research and he called me back in about an hour and said, have him call this company in Phoenix, Arizona. They can make that glass. And it was like, wow. So architects really do know what they're talking about when they design <laughs> stuff. So it was like an awakening for me. And so I used to think subs knew everything about what, I mean, I was a young kid at the time. But I, I came to really appreciate that, that great architecture, while it is, I, I, I'm going to keep say challenging, sometimes it's just a real pain to, to put up with that kind of mentality. But the end product is so much worth the effort going through to me that that's what makes a building a great building. Um, you know, being able to execute, you know, being able to execute a project doesn't mean anything if nobody can design it. And so uh, that's sort of where my passion is about. And uh, of course, my CEO wife reminds me that we have to have projects that pay for uh, copiers and uh, other things. So that's obviously not all what we do. But the San Antonio Museum of Art, uh, the old Lone Star Brewery, uh, I still uh, walk in there and smile when I look on the plaque and it says Guido Brothers Construction. Well, I kind of agree with Tom about these. It's not a fair question about which one is your memorable project. We have done so many projects, not of the magnitude and size of what Gary's company or Marley Cock has done, but we are, we are specializing in, in multifamily housing. 
And uh, five years ago, we broke into affordable housing, student housing, and seniors housing. We are doing all these three now, which is exciting. But the most memorable projects that I'm doing and we are done is for nonprofits, for people who really, really need the housing. And when you open up that project and when you talk to the residents who are moving in who had no home, who were living in horrible conditions, and when they each, each, each one of them, when you go and talk to them, come and want to bless you for what you did, that is the most humbling experience any contractor can ever have. Neither the, the good words of our clients or anything, or architects, or our lenders, our financials, ever match the word of gratitude and kindness that we hear from these residents. Last week, we had the grand opening of a very small project in Corpus Christi. We built that for LULAC. It's called LULAC Hacienda for Seniors. These people were living in mobile homes. And the day it opened, the next day, they were all moved in, all of them, 100%. And when we went to this grand opening, the mayor was there, I mean, the whole city, city council, everybody else. And you could just see in the eyes of these residents how thankful they are for this project that was being planned there for years and <coughs> due to politics and lack of funding and things were not possible, now it is possible. Now it is done. It is beautiful, it looks great. So if I have to pick those projects as my most memorable ones, not because they, they make a lot of money, but the, the satisfaction we get building those projects is you cannot measure in, 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 uh, in money at all. We have done some big projects, you know, our size is about 20, 25 million dollar projects. They all, <coughs> when they finish, you know, we get uh, compliments from our clients and all that, and that is great, wonderful, they, they pay our bills, and we are always obligated to them. The uh, one thing we do want to tell you guys here that our business is so addictive that you get so passionately involved with it because what we are doing as all of us here, we are contributing to the GDP of this country. <coughs> we are producing things and we are creating wealth for everybody. We are not a service business. We are not shuffling paper, not selling bonds. We don't do any of those things. We create product. That's what makes this business so exciting for us. Thank you. In, uh, in the interest of time, let, let me skip one question because I really want to uh, get your view on this one. Um, the, the changes in the last 20 years in our industry, personal, contractual, a, a, anything that you'd like to note? Who wants to talk? Oh, I'll start. <laughs> okay, Kathy. Um, in the last 20 years, um, I think there's about three or four things that I have observed, and I think we're all uh, have a sense of running to keep caught up with it. Uh, but the first has been the change in communications. Uh, when I started in this industry, we had a telephone. And then, amazingly, somebody uh, developed a fax machine, and we could go to the office supply down the street and send a fax to somebody. Um, then they just develop pagers and then they develop what we used to call the brick phones and they weighed a ton. Um, and then, you know, you guys today all have, uh, substantially have smartphones and tablets and all of that. We're getting software that's written so that we can use them in the field. So it, it's this instantaneous communication which is, uh, probably as much as anything pushed the ability for us to make decisions quicker and for the owner to be more engaged with our projects. Um, the software that we're using now is more predictive and, and the highest level of that is BIM. Um, so the, the two more things that, in, that I've seen. Uh, one is that our safety 
programs have gotten really effective and safe. Uh, and, and it's a product of many, many years of working with OSHA, working with each other, working within our industry organizations like AGC, ABC, and then it's finally, you know, a real realization that our clients seek, particularly Jars and Bartlett Cock and Guido and uh, Galaxy and, and my firm and others, because we can demonstrate a safe job site. Yeah. And the final thing, which probably is unique to me as a woman, is that as I've worked with students as interns uh, through the Industry Council uh, at Texas A&M and then now here at uh, UTSA, there is, I've seen almost a blurring of the, the lines that used to separate uh, young men and young women in the uh, construction industry. And I'm seeing young women and young men choosing to be partners on projects and in study and in work uh, because they're looking for the person that's going to work with them to make their project a success. So now we see young ladies that are estimators, project managers, uh, uh, they're in the accounting, the marketing, they're, they're all through the uh, construction industry. Uh, and as teams, they're about, about as strong, uh, the young men and young women, it's about as strong a team as you can build when you've got, you know, that much brain power and that much synergy going on. So I think that's a huge one that's occurred and might benefit your daughter, Gary. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I keep trying to twist her arm, but uh, so far she's in marketing and advertising, so ah. she may end up in that, that part of the construction business. Um, well, since I'm talking, I'll, I'll kind of echo what you said. Um, we are seeing uh, as well, a lot more women in the construction industry. Uh, we're seeing a lot more students and and uh, a lot more a lot more women going into this industry, and and a lot more very successful women going into this industry. Uh, one of our ex uh, employees, who's kind of retired and gone to work for a school district now, was the first uh, AGC general a uh, uh, first AGC uh, woman president. Uh, I see Doug out in the audience out there. Um, one of our, uh, our female CFO was the first uh, ABC um, female president. I see Steve back there, hey Steve. Uh, so we are seeing a lot more uh, very successful uh, women coming into this industry and it's, it's, it's nice there. They tend to be a little more organized than guys. They sometimes have more strengths than, than guys and so it's, it's nice. Um, the biggest thing I think, guess I've seen over the last uh, 20 years, one of the big things I guess, is just the, the marketplace here in, in San Antonio. We've grown from kind of a small town to a big town. 20 years ago, there was probably the local guys here and, and a few other local guys, the, the Lidas and the, some other guys that were doing the, you know, the bulk of the work and, and, and uh, the good and bad part of San Antonio being being a, a growing city is that we've got a lot of work to chase here. But uh, by the same token, it's brought in a lot of new faces, a lot of big billion-dollar boys, uh, which means we've got to all kind of refocus uh, our marketing and, and our project delivery and make sure we're doing things better and, and as good as these big guys that are coming in from out of town. So. Um, you know, the technology side is something that we've, uh, that we've all uh, experienced the growth in, the BIM and the lean and the, uh, all those things that, that we're trying to do better and, and, and do like the big boys are doing coming into town. So um, uh, I guess uh, those are some of the things I see as been big industry changes. I would add to that, and, and coincidentally, we just hired our first female superintendent well, uh, good for you. <laughs> so, uh, the language in the trailer should be a lot better. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think one of the things I, I've seen over the last 20 years that's changed dramatically, and I think here, here's a testament to it right here, is uh, the higher education community is doing a lot better at preparing individuals for our industry. Uh, 
when I entered into the uh, the workforce, you know, you, you knew somebody and you went to work for a friend of your dad's or you were a family member, you entered in and you, you went to work. I mean, you maybe worked up through the trade, but, you know, uh, uh, the demand for a college uh, educated person that's going to enter the industry really didn't come into play heavily in my mind until probably late 80s, early 90s, maybe, maybe past that. But we, it's grown substantial since then. And, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, I would say 15 years ago, I didn't know what a job, a career fair was, uh, you know, to go and, and, and look at prospective employees for your company. And now it seems like we go, we're, you know, we're at one every, every month. So I think, I think a lot of that has to do with the supply and demand and, and uh, academia working with industry to, to fill a, a void that we had. And obviously, uh, if you look at the program here at UTSA, uh, the, the, the amount of growth we've seen in a very short time here is quite honestly, I wouldn't say through the efforts, but through the demands of a lot of uh, the ladies and gentlemen here at this, this table this evening. Uh, and going back 15 some odd years ago, Doug, when we first started having the conversation with Dr. Dr. Gilbro. So anyway, I think that to me is, other than the technology stuff we've seen and will continue to see, that is one of the things I've, I've noticed is just the uh, students are, are the, the workforce, the college graduates are coming out much more prepared to enter the workforce in our industry. So I'd, I'd, I'd just like to phrase that as sort of a, a higher level of professionalism in the, in the industry, mm -hmm. which is what you're talking about. And uh, that is definitely one of the changes that have happened in the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, uh, other things that I would uh, talk about is it, it appears that, uh, you know, sort of a, we're not in the computer making business where every year, what is it, half half the price and twice the speed or something. But in our industry, there always seems to be shorter time frames for construction. It doesn't matter how fast you've built the last HEB, the next one has to be faster. Right, Gary? Mm -hmm. I mean, isn't that how the system works? Yep. And so, you know, we seem to be trying to build faster, and I'm gonna say with less information. Um, the, the plans, and I, I'm not harping on it, it's just a fact of life, in fact, I heard an architect say, well, we're only supposed to do 90% of the plans. All the rest you're supposed to do on the shop drawings. We're, why are you wanting 100% plans? There's no such thing. I don't know. Um, it's a little confusing in that regard, but I think that's something that the industry trend is having to deal with. Um, I, I think it, it appears in, 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 I don't know if this is true, but it seems like we're expected to take on more risk as an industry. And uh, I don't like that trend because it's risky enough as it is. And I, I don't know what we can do about it, but it's something that, that needs to be addressed. Um, the, the last two things I just would like to add is, um, I think there's a lot more teamwork in construction. Or maybe it's, I don't think the word got invented recently. It just seems to be collaboration is just, uh, you know, your subs or your partners. And you know, you, uh, they're 80% of the job or 75 or 90% or sometimes if you're a construction manager, 100% of the job. And so you're not getting anything done without being collaborative. And so that's just the way business gets done. The, the last thing that I, uh, I was just thinking about this as a real, in a real practical terms, if, if you look at a set of plans that was drawn in 1927, there's five pages. And one of them might be millwork. So there was no electrical except maybe a on the floor plan. There's no air conditioning. Um, you definitely didn't have landscape and irrigation, which I think now is about 20 or 25% of the plans that we get. And so, you know, I just think that the, the, the complex world of environmental and, uh, you know, the electrical and the fire alarm and go, it goes on and on and on. It's, it's so much more complex building a building. And so when you think about it, you you're have 25 or 30 companies working together on a project that they've never built a project together, all of them, ever. So it's a unique thing. It's a one-of-a-kind project. And so it's, it's the challenge that we have. And it's, it's really one of the reasons it's so rewarding is because when you're done, you've, you've got something that works. Well, most of the points 
that what has changed in the last 20 years, uh, we have already heard, heard from our distinguished panel. Uh, I might want to disagree with some of the things, and that being because we are in a very specialized business of multifamily construction, where if you really look at the, the talent level of people in our business, in our subcontractor base and all that, is different than on the commercial side. And we pay a very heavy price for that, uh, and we are paying a heavy price for that over last several years as things have changed. Uh, I do, however, agree that more women are coming in our business, which is a wonderful thing. And uh, our safety has tremendously gone up uh, over the last four, uh, 20 years. This technology that we are having right now is, is incredible. We are able to communicate with each other. I mean, real-time issues we can discuss, solve the problems. But on the, on, the, on the other side, what we are seeing is what I'm seeing, I don't know about others, that we are losing efficiency in our projects. And I see that across the board in our business. Uh, there are tremendous amount of code issues now that we're not there before. So the code compliance has become a huge challenge. Uh, the plans that we generally get in our, to build projects from, puts all the responsibility on the contractor for code compliance. And that's a, it's an evolving issue from city to city, and there are just too many challenges that you have to go through. And we don't even expect a lot of our subs to, to be up to date with them, so they, generally price the projects the way they see them, but when the time comes and we are not following any codes, we are the ones who, who take all the hits, which is, which is pretty sad. Uh, I think over time this will all correct itself, but right now it is, that's what we are facing. Uh, what I see in our, our people, our employees, some of our subs, that there is so much information overload that they can't seem to think rationally. I, I generally used to tell them, I still tell them, I said, look, take one hour of your time in the office or in the field just by yourself. Think what you're going to do, how you're going to do this. That is just not there. Now I go on my job site, I walk with the superintendent, he's got 15 phone calls he's getting, and half of them are from his girlfriend or his wife. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It never happened before, because we, as, as she said, we didn't have those phones. We didn't. No. We worked with these yellow pads, <laughs> and you know it was wonderful. <laughs> bottom line is, bottom line is that 10, 15 years ago, I was able to build a 250-unit project in 12 months. Now it takes me 16. So tell me where the progress is. And so that's how we are pricing it. It's a lot more expensive expensive than the inflation is. Plus now we are facing critical shortage of skilled people, skilled labor. They're not here. And a lot of the people in our industry have left. And we are having, I don't know about you guys, we are finding very great difficulty in the mechanical, electrical, plumbing trades. Sheetrock hangers, we just are having a hard time finding. If, and even if you pay them more money, they're just not there. So these are the challenges we are going through right now. And then each city we go to, we have different energy code. We have a different lead certification requirements. You have to go through a lot of stuff. You have to over, you have to, our overhead has to be much higher now to run a project than we, we could do before. Before, one of my project managers could do three projects and bid one. Now he cannot even do two. It's just, just too much around him. So I'm just, it's a challenge that, I, I, that I'm going to ask you or the, or the young generation to tell us more simplified procedures where we can be more efficient, use this technology and being a really build these projects in half the time. We are just not able to do it. Okay, um, 
in the interest of time, I'm going to ask one last question, and this is a quick answer, actually. Then we'll uh, open the, the um, floor for the questions. Um, that's actually the last one in your uh, list. Um, if you were to hire a construction manager for your company today, what would your perfect employee look like? That's for the benefit of our students, so. Well, I just jotted down three things that I'll just I'll start with. Uh, work ethic, patience, and, and persistence. Um, you know, we see a, a lot of uh, kids coming out of the programs, and, and, and fortunately, a lot of those programs, like the UTSA one and, and, and others, call for our work, work experience, uh, internships and stuff. I think that's a, uh, you know, uh, a good way to improve and, and hone your work ethic, and, and uh, you know, we just want to see people coming to work that want to work, not that are looking for excuses not to work. Uh, patience uh, is, and I just give, will give you a good example. Um, we, I see resumes all the time where a guy changes job about every one or two years. And uh, that's kind of a big red flag because uh, I can just about bet he'll only last at our company about one or two years. So my thought is if you, uh, you know, find a good company and you stick it out, that the good things will come uh, if you just, you know, keep keep learning, keep keep doing the best you can, that the patience pays off. And then persistence. Um, you know, th throughout life you're going to get knocked down and uh, you just have to pick yourself up and brush your shoulders off and you see your pants and keep going. Uh, if you can imagine how many jobs we bid as, as contractors to get one job, uh, I mean, if we got down and out every time we got beat on a job, uh, we'd be in mental middle state, middle <laughs> hospital. So it's uh, something you just got to keep on pushing and, and, uh, and, and uh, move on to the next project. Uh, I think G Gary and I sh sh uh, very strongly share something in common as far as the patients part. And we're seeing, we're experiencing the same thing. Uh, with, uh, and my, my view is very much the same as when I actually do that, go through the exercise and I see a resume, the first thing I do is guess how many years this person's been in the business and how many different jobs he's been at and come up with an average number of years and like Gary said I'll say well that's how long we will have this person so uh, I echo with what Gary said the person that's coming into the workforce I think needs to be looking for an opportunity to find a company with a long history like many of the, all the companies that are, that are represented here this evening uh, and be patient and not being able, not be, being afraid to roll up your sleeves uh, and do some work. Uh, you know, quite honestly, uh, an automatic hire for us is a person that says, I want to be a superintendent or an estimator. Those are so, uh, those two particular uh, uh, job descriptions right now are just so hard to come by. So if somebody says, that's really what I want to do, then I say, we're going to take that person and, and if that's what they want to do, we're going to teach them. And, and mold them, and uh, if they've got the desire, we've got this, we've got the knowledge to teach them. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is uh, something else we'd be looking for as far as a profile be, is for many of you that are working through school, is I, I would I would like to see uh, on a resume that you've spent your time working through school at a job that's in our industry. Uh, obviously, that's not always possible. There are other obviously a lot of different individual circumstances but you know I think uh, a person that's got some real experience in our industry uh, that graduates uh, I think really has a leg up on the person that, that graduates and maybe have, has worked but have, you know worked at McDonald's or, or, or doing whatever uh, try and get a job pursue a job in your industry even if it's part-time uh, they're a part-time I don't I can't speak for everybody up here but we'd be happy to hire some folks part-time uh, if you need to to work some while you're going to school. We, we routinely do that, so. Uh, and I subscribe to, to what both those gentlemen said. Um, one of the things that we're looking for is candidates that have good communication skills, uh, good writing skills, understand the beauty of grammar, uh, has good skills at speaking, because you're going to have to be able to communicate 
with the architects, the subcontractors, with, with the folks in the office. And um, you have to make yourself heard and yourself understood because what we do involves contracts and many, many, many dollars. And so this is one of the areas that we, there needs to be strong concentration. Expect to come in as a team member. That's the way most of us are set up. Uh, and the last thing that I would add is that you do yourself well when you are respectful of uh, the people that work around you, not just your boss. I mean, I mean, you're respectful of the subcontractor that's trying to schedule the work in. You're respectful of the work, the, the laborers, the carpenters that, that work for your company. Uh, you're respectful for your peers in, in the company because the, the bottom line is it takes all of us at all of those jobs to make it happen. And so there's, we're not really set up to have mavericks in our organizations. We need team members and be prepared and look forward to that opportunity. Uh, you know, they've, they've, they've covered a lot of things and this may be repeated, but uh, you know, we're looking for people that are, are hardworking, uh, have a great work ethic. I think that was already mentioned. Uh, we like people with self-starters that have initiative uh, there's a lot of ways to express this as a student or as a potential employee. One of them is the internship program, and uh, we, well, we, we, we really like to look for people that have expressed an interest in working in the construction industry. Um, we like uh, people that are adaptable to change because th that's one thing that surely happens in our business. Uh, the way we do business in 2014 and the way we do business in 2020, 2020 it, it's just not going to be the same. Uh, it's it's changing at such a rapid rate. You have to be able to be able to take that in and, and make it mean something. Um, we we also like to look for people that are problem solvers because, uh, as you mentioned, um, there's always issues and you have to have respect and give respect and and it's it's just a two way street. Well, all these points are very well spoken today and I think all the students who are here they take to heart what has been said <coughs> every one of them is a pertinent point the the only thing I would just add is that when we we not only look for all or most of these things uh, we look for your value system your background how you got your degree what you did in and so on and so forth. We want to see your level of confidence in yourself and your ability. We also want to find out that you're, you are probably one of those millennial generations, but instant gratification, we discourage that. <laughs> and, 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 and lastly, we look for people who have attention to detail, because that's what makes a company, people who are there who pay attention to details. Thank you. I can, would I add one thing, I tell you what a perfect employee does not look like, and he's somebody that comes in to interview, chewing gum with a shirt tail <laughs> out, and he's, that sounds silly, but you'd be surprised at the number of people I have coming in my office chewing gum. So when you're going to interview, interview like you're trying to outshine the next guy and you've got a lot of competition uh, in this in this room and, and, and around the state so okay um, so let's open the floor for some questions Thank you. we actually would like you to use the microphones if you can since we're recording this we want to get the questions in know how BIM might be working in the apartment business, which is a, a, a niche of building, but, uh, you know, the, the kind of projects that we're working on, like at SeaWorld, and, you know, they're, they're not even really buildings, half of them, but, but uh, that's just one of the things I see. Well, in our business, the BIM is not there yet. It's going to come, but it's not there. 
we are about five to ten years behind commercial contractors in technology. But we, we still feel very confident about the future. Future is going to be very bright for all the young people coming into this business because they are going to bring new techniques to make us more efficient, more faster. I mean, I, in our business, architecture will always be prime because we, we need architects to draw those conceptual buildings and plans uh, for people to live and uh, where they can and enjoy themselves. Quality of life is a big issue. So in our planning meetings, we call them programming meetings. When we meet a client, we start out with one sheet of plans, which has a site plan and one typical floor plan and elevation. So we start working on the estimating right there. So the client has a pretty good idea. If this, this, this cost goes way beyond his budget, then we start cutting right then. So he does not. The, the plans never get to that point where it is too late to change. So by, by the time the plans are 30% done, we, we pretty well know these costs will come in line. Uh, well, after the first of the year, I got interested in uh, what, what was the direction of this uh, industry. Because, you know, first of the year, you kind of think forward to, you know, what's coming down the pike and kind of get your team lined up and everything. And I found an article in the Construction Financial Management Association uh, magazine called Building Profits, which is a magazine I would commend to all of you as you begin your professional careers. But on a looking at it at a little bigger scale, what they found were four, I think it's four, maybe five trends that they believe we're going to be seeing over the next 10, 15 years. And uh, one of them, the very first one they start out with is uh, what they're calling a low bid commodification mentality, which is a big fancy way to say that buyers are wanting to get construction purchased like it's a commodity, like you would go to Lowe's or Home Depot. And it has been a buyer's market. Hopefully, that's going to change. It, it doesn't apply necessarily to us here because we have specialty areas and we have long-term clients, but a lot of the smaller new entry into construction uh, firms are going to find themselves kind of in that kind of a bidding uh, environment. Uh, they cited technological innovation and they're talking about the software, they're talking about the communications, all the stuff that we've said before. But one thing I found interesting was that they cited plentiful and affordable domestic energy resources, and they, they demonstrated how the United States is almost completely independent in terms of being able to produce uh, the fuels, uh, fossil fuels that we'll need, plus other sources of energy. And they said one of the things they, they cited was that many of the contractors that work in the petrochemical and the oil industry uh, are getting saturated with the work because there's so much opportunity that there will be many contractors that are repositioning themselves to look into some of that. And the, the last thing they said is something that we've been seeing for a couple of years now, and that's, Tommy brought it up, uh, collaboration contractors hooking up with architects and engineers where they either hire each other as, as or they, they buy each other as businesses or they bring onto their staff what they don't have, whether it's an engineer or an architect or maybe they need a good contractor um, because by collaborating in that method, they are able to better produce for the client to produce more rapidly. Uh, and of course, you know, that kind of looks like uh, a, a uh, BIM structure, if you will. Uh, that's where they filled in all the gaps of the people and the <coughs> skills that are necessary. So um, I have no reason to disagree with this. This is food for thought. Uh, I brought up the article for Dr. K uh, for his, his review. But uh, those, are, those are things that I think are potential trends for us. I, I would add one to that, and I think this uh, this trend is something we've seen quite honestly through the sustainability movement uh, but also something that really lends itself to being uh, catapulted by the, uh, the evolution of BIM and where we see BIM going but that's prefabrication uh, prefabrication of materials and assemblies 
for buildings uh, that are built off-site perhaps and shipped in or built in a controlled environment mm -hmm. and, and a lot of this uh, will be impacted and I think heavily by what Aaron mentioned earlier and that's the lack of a skilled workforce that we see moving forward uh, that will lend itself to, to less labor being able to prefabricate in a controlled environment off the site and, and perhaps quite honestly as it speaks to sustainability with a lot less waste than what you sometimes see on a job site. Uh, a lot of, you, know, you, you always see a 40-yard dumpster on a job site and it just pains me every time you see that thing being hauled off because it's typically filled full of scrap materials or in some cases misfabricated materials going to the, to the dump, dump site. And not only did, did it cost you money to have it hauled off, but you know there's a lot of money sitting inside that dumpster that went down the drain. So I think prefabrication is something we, we really look forward to in, in the years to come. Okay. Well, one, other, one other thing, um, a firm that's right next door to us where, uh, is named Elevate. And what they do is they are uh, back engineering airplane parts, um, B-52s, B-50s, <clears throat> and they're, uh, the Air Force doesn't have the prints anymore. The planes are 50 years old, and so they're trying to keep them in the air. And they, they should be able to stay in the air for quite a long, but they, they, don't, they can't get the parts. So this firm was hired to back engineer those parts. Well, whenever they, they complete the, the prints on them and get all of the engineering done, they're sending it out and having them print it. They're just using, you know, 3D these modeling. 3D, 3D, 3D printing. 3D printing, printing yeah. exactly. Yeah. And I, I think we've all heard that there will be instances where building components are going to be produced by 3D printing. So. Well, um, we're out of time. So thank you all for doing this. This is wonderful. So let's give a round of applause. Thank you all.